Page 1. Creative Evolution? Comma Campbell and Schopf, 1994. This book contains six chapters. Chapter 1. Darwin's Revolution. Chapter 2. Progress and Direction in Evolution. Chapter 3. The Resistance to Darwinism and the Misconceptions on which it was based. Chapter 4. Evolutionary Creativity and Complex Adaptations, A Molecular Biologist's Perspective. Chapter 5. The Evolution of Human Creativity. Chapter 6. Organisms Create Evolution. This test represents the proceedings of a symposium by the Center for the Study of Evolution and the Origin of Life at the University of California, Los Angeles in March, 1993. Six leading evolutionists discuss the creativity of the evolutionary process. This reference will be useful for the general reader curious about Darwin's theory of evolution. As is pointed out, Copernicus showed that Earth is not the center of the universe, Newton showed that motions of planets can be explained by simple physical laws, and then Darwin completed this Copernican revolution by showing that origin of new, highly organized forms of life could be explained by similar natural laws, in this case, adaptive variations and natural selection. Evidence for evolution comes from paleontology, comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, comparative ethology, animal behavior, biogeography, geographical distribution of animals, genetics, comparative biochemistry and molecular biology. Preface Creative Evolution records the proceedings of a symposium by that title sponsored by the Center for the Study of Evolution and the Origin of Life, CL, at the University of California, Los Angeles in March 1993. Six leading evolutionists discussed the creativity of the evolutionary process. These articles convey their ideas to college-level students and educated lay people. 134 years after Darwin's The Origin of Species, the historical fact of evolution has been scientifically established. Natural selection is the central mechanism for evolutionary change joined by various other processes, such as mutation and random genetic drift. There is also close agreement about the general course of evolution over the past three billion years, as revealed by the geological record and comparative study of contemporary organisms. In contrast, fundamental disagreements remain about some of the properties of the evolutionary process. Two of the most important disagreements concern the sense in which the evolutionary process is creative and whether life progresses or advances as it evolves. Has the history of life been a soap opera in which the actors are forever changing, confronting crisis after crisis and shifting their fortunes but getting nowhere, because there is no work to get to? Or, is a dramatic play with a story and characters progressing from act to act the proper metaphor? Creative Evolution? Invites the reader to share the diverse perspectives of some of the leading North American evolutionists. Their views range from a disdain for the very idea of evolutionary progress to the thesis that not only do organisms as the creations of evolution progress with time, but the very process itself advances. Two chapters describe the most creative accomplishments of life, from its origin to the great leap forward to humankind. Others discuss the philosophy and history of evolution as a creative process. This book, then, presents a third level of discussion about evolution. The first volume of this series, based on a 1991 XL symposium, traces the facts of major events in the history of life through geological time. The second examines the diverse mechanisms for the origin and evolution of humans and humanness. Here is a synthesis of the solved and unsolved problems relating to the fundamental properties of the evolutionary process. Chapter 1, 
Darwin's Revolution, by Francisco J. Ayala. Donald Brent Professor of Biological Sciences and Professor of Philosophy at the University of California, Irvine, Dr. Ayala was born in Spain, where he received his undergraduate education at the University of Madrid. He received his advanced degrees from Columbia University and served on the faculties of Biology, Genetics, and of Ecology at Providence College, Rockefeller University, and the University of California, Davis, before joining the faculty at the University of California, Irvine, in 1987. The author of more than 500 research papers and eight books, Professor Ayala is recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and of two Fulbright Fellowships of Distinguished Awards from the American Genetics Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the College of France and of honorary doctorate degrees from universities in Greece, Spain, and France. He is a member of the American Philosophical Society, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a foreign member of the Royal Academy of Sciences of Spain. Internationally renowned for his pioneering studies of genetics and evolution, he served as an expert witness in the 1981 Arkansas trial on the teaching of evolution. He is past president of the Society for the Study of Evolution and currently is president-elect of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Introduction I vividly remember the day in 1971 when it was announced in New York that the Metropolitan Museum of Art had acquired at Auction and Christie's London headquarters the painting Juan de Perge by Diego Valle tilde inverted exclamation marks The Metropolitan had paid the staggering sum of $5,544,000, more than had ever before been paid for a painting, no matter how illustrious the artist or distinguished the work. Thomas Hoving, the Metropolitan's director at the time, has recently referred to Juan de Perge as the most important painting in world history, figure 1.1. This is hyperbole, but there can be little doubt that this painting is one of the finest portraits grafted by the great Spanish master. In the summer of 1649 Velázquez had brought with him from Madrid to Rome his Moorish servant and painted him while getting ready to portray Pope Innocent X. The Juan de Perja is distinctively Velázquez's in the long but firm brush stroke and the clarity of execution, and in the color palette, with the body executed in browns textured with brilliant reds and blacks, and set dramatically aside from the face by a large white shirt collar extending from neck to shoulder. Like other of Velázquez's portraits of this period, form is created by color. Valle tilde inverted exclamation Marquez is said to have made a point of sending Perja to visit his friends carrying the portrait so as to astonish them with its vivid likeness. In the spring of 1650 the painting was exhibited to great critical acclaim in Rome's Pantheon and this success may have been a reason for Valle tilde inverted exclamation Marquez's election to the Roman Academy later that year. In distant northern India a few years later, an unknown Muslim craftsman forged the dagger of Aurangzeb, figure 1.2, one of the most exquisite treasures in the great collection of Indian decorative arts held by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. The hilt, in the form of a horse's head and neck, is crafted from green jade highlighted in dark orange. The blade, made of damascene steel, is shaped in the curvilinear conjure style and exhibits floral ornaments and an inscription inlaid in gold with the date 1660-61. The Taj Mahal had just been built at Agra by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan as a mausoleum to honor his dead wife, Mumtaz Mahal. The dagger of Aurangz was designed not only as a weapon, but also as a decorative object. Its author was a refined artist, not just a craftsman. Copernican Revolution The publication in 1859 of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin ushered in a new era in the intellectual history of mankind. Darwin is deservedly given credit for the theory of biological evolution, 
he accumulated evidence demonstrating that organisms evolve and discovered the process, natural selection, by which they evolve. However, the import of Darwin's discovery transcends science. The ultimate significance of Darwin's achievement is that it completed the Copernican revolution initiated three centuries earlier, and thereby radically changed our conception of the universe and the place of mankind in it. The discoveries of Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton in the 16th and 17th centuries had gradually ushered in a conception of the universe as matter in motion governed by natural laws. It was shown that the Earth is not the center of the universe, but rather a small planet rotating around an average star that the universe is immense in space and in time and that the motions of the planets around the Sun can be explained by the same simple laws that account for the motion of physical objects on our planet. These and other discoveries greatly expanded human knowledge, but the conceptual revolution they brought about was even more fundamental. A realization that the universe obeys immanent laws that can account for natural phenomena. The workings of the universe were brought into the realm of science, explanation through natural laws. Physical phenomena could be reliably predicted whenever the causes were adequately known. Darwin completed the Copernican revolution by drawing out for biology the ultimate conclusion of the notion of nature as a lawful system of matter in motion. The adaptations and diversity of organisms, the origin of novel and highly organized forms of life even the origin of man himself could be explained by an orderly process of change governed by natural laws. The Argument from Design Before Darwin, the origin of organisms and their marvelous adaptations were most frequently attributed to the design of an omniscient creator. God had created the birds and bees the fish and corals, the trees in the forest, and best of all, man. God had given man eyes so that he might see, and he had provided fish with gills to breathe in water. Philosophers and theologians argued that the functional design of organisms manifests the existence of an all-wise creator. Wherever there is design, there is a designer the existence of a watch evinces the existence of a watchmaker. The wand de Perja and the dagger of all ranks are surely the products of elaborate designs exquisitely carried out by their authors. In the 13th century, Street Thomas Aquinas had used the argument from design as his fifth way to demonstrate the existence of God. In the 19th century the English theologian William Paley argued in his Natural Theology, 1802, that the functional design of the human eye provided conclusive evidence of an all-wise creator. It would be absurd to suppose, wrote Paley, that the human eye by mere chance should have consisted, first, of a series of transparent lenses, secondly of a black cloth or canvas spread out behind these lenses so as to receive the image formed by pencils of light transmitted through them, and placed at the precise geometrical distance at which, and at which alone, a distinct image could be formed, thirdly of a large nerve communicating between this membrane and the brain. The Bridgewater Treatises, published between 1833 and 1840, were written by eminent scientists and philosophers to set forth the power, wisdom, and goodness of God as manifested in the creation. The structure and mechanisms of man's hand were, for example, cited as incontrovertible evidence that the hand had been designed by the same omniscient power that had created the world. The advances of physical science had thus driven mankind's conception of the universe to a split personality state of affairs, which persisted well into the mid-19th century. Scientific explanations, derived from natural laws, dominated the world of non-living matter, on earth as well as in the heavens. Supernatural explanations, depending on the unfathomable deeds of the Creator, accounted for the origin and configuration of living creatures the most diversified, complex, and interesting realities of the world. It was Darwin's genius to resolve this conceptual schizophrenia. Darwin's Discovery, Design Without Designer 
the conundrum faced by Darwin can hardly be overestimated. The strength of the argument from design to demonstrate the role of the creator is easily set forth. Wherever there is function or design we look for its author. A knife is made for cutting and a clock is made to tell time their functional designs have been contrived by a knife maker and a watchmaker. The Juan de Perja is not a random assemblage of pigments, nor is the configuration of the dagger of all ranks been accident of nature their exquisite designs proclaim that they were created by gifted artists for specific purposes. Similarly, the structures, organs, and behaviors of living beings are directly organized to serve certain functions. The functional design of organisms and their features would therefore seem to argue for the existence of a designer. It was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the directive organization of living beings can be explained as the result of a natural process, natural selection, without any need to resort to a creator or other external agent. The origin and adaptation of organisms and their profusion in wondrous variations were thus brought into the realm of science. Darwin recognized that organisms are functionally organized. They are adapted to certain ways of life and their parts are adapted to perform certain functions. Fish are adapted to live in water, kidneys are designed to regulate the composition of blood, the hand of man is made for grasping. Darwin accepted the fact of adaptation and then provided a natural explanation for that fact. He thereby brought the design aspects of living beings into the realm of science. Darwin gathered ample evidence for the occurrence of evolution, but more revolutionary still was the fact that he extended the Copernican revolution to the world of living things. The origin and adaptive nature of organisms could now be explained like the phenomena of the inanimate world, as the result of natural laws manifested in natural processes. Darwin's theory encountered opposition in religious circles, not so much because he proposed the evolutionary origin of living things, which had been proposed many times before, even by Christian theologians, but because his mechanism, natural selection, excluded God as the explanation accounting for the obvious design of organisms. The Roman Catholic Church's opposition to Galileo in the 17th century had been similarly motivated. The Evidence for Evolution Paleontology and Comparative Anatomy Darwin supported his argument for the evolution of species with two sorts of evidence. The first came from paleontology. The fossil remains of organisms that lived in the past provide definite clues to the phylogeny, or evolutionary history, of organisms. The second kind of evidence came from the comparative study of living organisms. The logical basis of phylogenetic inference in this case is that evolution is by and large a gradual process, so that organisms sharing a recent common ancestor are likely to be more similar to each other than are organisms with a common ancestor only in a remote past. Relative degrees of similarity are therefore used to infer recency of common descent. The task of reconstructing evolutionary history from the study of living organisms is far from simple. For example, Resemblances due to common descent must be set apart from resemblances due to similar ways of life, to life in the same or similar habitats, or to accidental convergence. The reconstruction of evolutionary history based on fossil remains also encounters difficulties. Nevertheless, the evidence gathered by Darwin overwhelmingly supported the evolution of organisms. Paleontology and comparative anatomy were until about the mid-20th century, the biological disciplines that provided the strongest evidence for evolution and the best information about evolutionary history. Additional knowledge was obtained from comparative embryology, the study of the early development of organisms, comparative ethology, the study of animal behavior, and biogeography, the study of the geographical distribution of organisms. The argument for evolution based on comparative anatomy is illustrated by the similarity in the forelimbs of humans, dogs, 
whales, and birds, bone by bone, despite the different ways of life of these animals. The same bone structures are used for such diverse purposes as riding, running, swimming, or flying, because these structures were inherited from a reptilian ancestor common to all of these organisms. See figure 1.7. Genetics and biochemistry Modern biology has on the whole corroborated Darwin's view of biological evolution and has added depth and much more detail to our understanding of the processes. The science of genetics, which burst into existence with the advent of the 20th century, has made a particularly significant contribution. Darwin's theory of natural selection assumes that hereditary variation is pervasive. Yet Darwin knew no plausible mechanism to account for the origin of hereditary novelty and had only tenuous evidence of its existence. Genetics has filled this gap. Comparative biochemistry has provided much evidence for the unity of biology at a molecular level, underneath the infinite variety of animals and plants in their gross structure and function. Different organisms need different metabolic pathways sequences of enzymatic reactions, to initiate the use of different foodstuffs to meet the two major biochemical needs of all cells, energy and building blocks for the synthesis of cell constituents. However, these diverse pathways soon converge on pathways that are the same throughout the living world, yielding energy in the same way, and leading to precisely the same components of proteins and nucleic acids. Molecular Evolution the living record of evolution, proteins and DNA. The fusion of biochemistry and genetics in the mid-20th century has yielded molecular biology. This, the newest of all biological disciplines, has provided the most direct and reliable source of evidence for reconstructing evolutionary history. The possibility exists today of determining the evolutionary history of any group of organisms with as much detail as wanted. Only the limitations of human or other resources stand in the way of reconstructing the grand panorama of the evolution of all life, from the lowly bacteria of three and a half thousand million years ago to the microorganisms, animals, and plants of today. The proteins and nucleic acids that are essential to the makeup of all organisms are informational macromolecules that retain a record of their evolutionary history. The evolutionary information is contained in the linear sequence of their component elements in much the same way as semantic information is contained in the sequence of letters of an English sentence. This evolutionary information is so detailed that it not only makes it possible to reconstruct the phylogenetic topology, or evolutionary relationships of parentage of organisms, but also opens up the possibility of timing the events in the history, even those that occurred in the remote past of life's history. As a means to reconstruct evolutionary history, Molecular biology has two notable advantages over comparative anatomy in the other classical disciplines. One advantage is that the information is readily quantifiable, the number of units that differ between organisms is readily established when the sequence of the component units is known for a given protein or gene. A second advantage is that all sorts of organisms, however different, can be compared. There is very little that comparative anatomy can say about the relative similarity of organisms as diverse as yeasts, pine trees, and human beings, but there are homologous macromolecules that can be compared among all three. Nucleic acids and proteins are linear molecules made up of units, called nucleotides in the case of nucleic acids, amino acids in the case of proteins. Evolution typically occurs by the substitution of these units, one at a time, so that the number of differences between two organisms is an indication of the recency of their common ancestry, in a similar way as the distance between two cars reflects how long they have been traveling in different directions. Molecular Trees Comparison of two related macromolecules establishes the number of units by which they differ. For example, the numbers of amino acid differences among three species human, 
Reese's monkey, and horse with respect to cytochrome C, figure 1.8, a particular protein involved in electron transport in living cells, are shown in table 1.1. The phylogenetic tree summarizing the evolutionary history of these three species is known from classical evidence to be as represented in figure 1.9. The number of amino acid differences makes it possible to decide that the one difference between the cytochromes of human and monkey was due to the substitution of one amino acid by another in the human rather than a monkey lineage. This is necessary so as to account for the fact that there is one more difference between human and horse than between monkey and horse. Comparison with the fourth species for example, the penguin, which diverged from the other three species before these diverged from each other makes it possible to dissociate the number of substitutions that occurred between the last ancestor common to the three species and the last common ancestor of human and monkey from those that occurred between the last common ancestor of all three species and the horse, when the number of species in a phylogeny is greater than three. There is more than one solution for distributing the number of substitutions along the branches of the lineages. Statistical methods are used for deciding which one is the best solution. Assume that we did not know that humans and monkeys are more closely related to each other than they are to horses. The cytochrome C data indicate that humans and monkeys are more closely related to each other than they are to horses, as shown in figure 1.9. Two other topologies are possible for the same three species, see figure 1.10. These two other phylogenies, however, would seem to be unlikely, for they require numerous amino acid substitutions in one short branch, the lineage leading to the horse, and none or one substitution in the sister branch. The cytochrome C tree of life one of the most dramatic early applications of molecular biology to the reconstruction of phylogeny was made by Walter M. Fitch and Emanuel Margoliash. They calculated the number of substitutions necessary in the DNA to account for the amino acid differences in the cytochrome C molecules of 20 organisms, see Table 1.2. The phylogeny based on this data matrix, as well as the number of DNA, nucleotide, substitutions required in each branch, are shown in figure 1.11. The phylogenetic relationships obtained with the molecular data correspond well, on the whole, with the phylogeny of the organisms as determined from the fossil record and other sources. There are three conspicuous disagreements, however, chickens appear more closely related to penguins than to ducks and pigeons the turtle, a reptile is closer to the birds than to the rattlesnake men and monkeys diverge from other mammals before the marsupial kangaroo separates from the non-primate placentals. Despite these erroneous relationships, it is remarkable that the study of a single protein, and a small one at that, should yield such an accurate representation of the phylogeny of 20 organisms so diverse. Cytochrome C molecules are slowly evolving proteins that is, the rate of amino acid substitutions per unit time is low. Therefore, organisms as different as humans, moths, and neurosporum molds have a large proportion of amino acids in their cytochrome C molecules in common. This evolutionary conservation of this cytochrome makes possible the study of genetic differences among organisms that are only remotely related. However, this same conservation makes cytochrome C useless for determining evolutionary change in such closely related organisms as different tapes because these have cytochrome C molecules that are completely or nearly identical. For example, the primary structure of cytochrome C is identical in humans and chimpanzees, which diverged 5 to 10 million years ago it differs by only one amino acid between humans and rhesus monkeys whose most recent common ancestor lived 40 to 50 million years ago. Fortunately, different proteins evolve at different rates as a consequence of functional constraints. For example, when a protein has to fit into an organized structure, such as a membrane, much of its surface has to fit the neighboring molecules closely. Accordingly, 
replacements of an amino acid at the surface are more likely to destroy function than the same replacement in, say, a part of a protein that is cleaved and discarded, such as fibrinopeptide, at the time when the protein is stimulated to become an active enzyme. Evolutionary relationships among closely related organisms, such as humans, apes, and monkeys, can be inferred by studying the primary sequences of rapidly evolving proteins, like fibrinopeptides, whereas slowly evolving genes and proteins are used to reconstruct the evolutionary history of remotely related organisms. See Figure 1.12. Natural selection as a creative process. Darwin's argument. The central argument of the theory of natural selection is summarized by Darwin in The Origin of Species as follows. As more individuals are produced than can possibly survive, there must in every case be a struggle for existence, either one individual with another of the same species, or with the individuals of distinct species, or with the physical conditions of life. Can it, then, be thought improbable? seeing that variations useful to man have undoubtedly occurred, that other variations useful in some way to each being in the great and complex battle of life, should sometimes occur in the course of thousands of generations? If such do occur, can we doubt, remembering that more individuals are born than can possibly survive, that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others, would have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable variation and the rejection of injurious variations, I call natural selection. Darwin's argument addresses the problem of explaining the adaptive character of organisms. Darwin argues that adaptive variations, variations useful in some way to each being, occasionally appear, and that these are likely to increase the reproductive chances of their carriers. Over the generations, favorable variations will be preserved and injurious ones will be eliminated. In one place, Darwin adds, I can see no limit to this power, natural selection, in slowly and beautifully adapting each form to the most complex relations of life. Natural selection was proposed by Darwin primarily to account for the adaptive organization, or design, of living beings it is a process that promotes or maintains adaptation. Evolutionary change through time and evolutionary diversification, multiplication of species, are not directly promoted by natural selection, but they often ensue as byproducts of natural selection fostering adaptation. For Darwin Natural selection was primarily differential survival. The modern understanding of the principle of natural selection is formulated in genetic and statistical terms as differential reproduction. Natural selection implies that some genes and genetic combinations are transmitted to the following generations on the average more frequently than their alternates. Such genetic units will become more common in every subsequent generation and their alternates less common. Natural selection is a statistical bias in the relative rate of reproduction of alternative genetic units. Modes of creation, gods, arts, natural selections. Natural selection has been compared to a sieve that retains the rarely arising useful genes and lets go the more frequently arising harmful mutants. Natural selection acts in that way, but it is much more than a purely negative process, for it is able to generate novelty by increasing the probability of otherwise extremely improbable genetic combinations. Natural selection is thus creative in a way. It does not create the entities on which it operates, but it produces adaptive genetic combinations that would not have existed otherwise. The creative role of natural selection must not be understood in the sense of the absolute creation that traditional Christian theology predicates of the divine act by which the universe was brought into being ex nihilo. 
Natural selection may rather be compared to a painter who creates a picture by mixing and distributing pigments in various ways over the canvas. The canvas and the pigments are not created by the artist, but the painting is. It is conceivable that a random combination of the pigments might result in the orderly whole that is the final work of art. But the probability of Valet tilde inverted exclamation marks as is one apergy resulting from a random combination of pigments is infinitely small. In the same way, the combination of genetic units that carries the hereditary information responsible for the formation of the vertebrate could have never been produced by a random process like mutation, not even if we allow for the more than 3 billion years during which life has existed on Earth. The complicated anatomy of the eye and the exact functioning of a kidney are the result of a non-random process natural selection. The improbable comes to be. How natural selection, a purely material process, can generate novelty in the form of accumulated hereditary information may be illustrated by the following example. Some strains of the colon bacterium, Escherichia coli, in order to be able to reproduce in a culture medium require that a certain substance, the amino acid histidine, be provided in the medium. When a few such bacteria are added to a cubic centimeter of liquid culture medium, they multiply rapidly and produce between 2 and 3 billion bacteria in a few hours. Spontaneous mutations to streptomycin resistance occur in normal, that is, sensitive, bacteria at rates of the order of 1 in 100 million. 1 by 10 8 cells. In our bacterial culture we expect between 20 and 30 bacteria to be resistant to streptomycin due to spontaneous mutation. If a proper concentration of the antibiotic is added to the culture, only the resistant cells survive. The 20 or 30 surviving bacteria will start reproducing, however, and allowing a few hours for the necessary number of cell divisions. Several billion bacteria are produced, all resistant to streptomycin. Among cells requiring histidine as a growth factor, spontaneous mutants able to reproduce in the absence of histidine arise at rates of about 4 in 100 million, 4 by 10 8, bacteria. The streptomycin resistant cells may now be transferred to a culture with streptomycin but with no histidine. Most of them will not be able to reproduce, but about a hundred will start reproducing until the available medium is saturated. Natural selection has produced in two steps bacterial cells resistant to streptomycin and not requiring histidine for growth. The probability of the two mutational events happening in the same bacterium is of about 4 in 10 million billion, 1 by 10 8 by 4 by 10 8 equals 4 by 10 16, cells. An event of such low probability is unlikely to occur even in a large laboratory culture of bacterial cells. With natural selection, cells having both properties are the common result. The typing monkeys. Critics have sometimes alleged as evidence against Darwin's theory of evolution examples showing that random processes cannot yield meaningful organized outcomes. It is thus pointed out that a series of monkeys randomly striking letters on a typewriter would never write the origin of species, even if we allow for millions of years and many generations of monkeys pounding at typewriters. This criticism would be valid if evolution would depend only on random processes. But natural selection is a non-random process that promotes adaptation by selecting combinations that make sense, that is, combinations that are useful. The analogy of the monkeys would be more appropriate if a process existed by which, first, meaningful words would be chosen every time they appeared on the typewriter and second, we would also have typewriters with previously selected words rather than just letters in the keys and third, there would be a process to select meaningful sentences every time they appeared in this second typewriter. If every time words such as the origin, species, and so on, appeared in the first kind of typewriter, and each became a key in the second kind of typewriter, meaningful sentences would occasionally be produced. 
If such sentences became incorporated into keys of a third type of typewriter, in which meaningful paragraphs were selected whenever they appeared, it is clear that pages and even chapters making sense would eventually be produced. We need not carry the analogy too far, since no analogy is fully satisfactory, but the point is clear. Evolution is not the outcome of purely random processes but, rather, there is a selecting process, which picks up adaptive combinations because these reproduce more effectively and thus become established in populations. These adaptive combinations constitute, in turn, new levels of organization upon which the mutation, random, plus selection, non-random or directional, process again operates. As illustrated by the bacterial example, natural selection produces combinations of genes that would otherwise be highly improbable because natural selection proceeds stepwise. The vertebrate did not appear suddenly in all its present perfection. Its formation requires the appropriate integration of many genetic units, and thus the eye could not have resulted from random processes alone. The ancestors of today's vertebrates had for more than half a billion years some kind of organs sensitive to light. Perception of light, and later vision, were important for these organisms' survival and reproductive success. Accordingly, natural selection favored genes and gene combinations increasing the functional efficiency of the eye. Such genetic units gradually accumulated eventually leading to the highly complex and efficient vertebrate eye. Natural selection can account for the rise and spread of genetic constitutions and, therefore, of types of organisms that would never have existed under the uncontrolled action of random mutation. In this sense, natural selection is a creative process, although it does not create the raw materials the genes on which it acts. Natural selection as an opportunistic process. Design without foresight. There is an important respect in which an artist makes a poor analogy of natural selection. A painter usually has a preconception of what he wants to paint and will consciously modify the painting so that it represents what he wants. Natural selection has no foresight, nor does it operate according to some preconceived plan. Rather it is a purely natural process resulting from the interacting properties of physical chemical and biological entities. Natural selection is simply a consequence of the differential multiplication of living beings. It has some appearance of purposefulness because it is conditioned by the environment, which organisms reproduce more effectively depends on what variations they possess that are useful in the environment where the organisms live. But natural selection does not anticipate the environments of the future drastic environmental changes may be insuperable to organisms that were previously thriving. The team of typing monkeys is also a bad analogy of evolution by natural selection because it assumes that there is somebody who selects letter combinations and word combinations that make sense. In evolution there is no one selecting adaptive combinations. These combinations select themselves because they multiply more effectively than less adaptive ones. There is a sense in which the analogy of the typing monkeys is better than the analogy of the artist, at least if we assume that no particular statement was to be obtained from the monkeys' typing endeavors, but just any statements making sense. Natural selection does not strive to produce predetermined kinds of organisms but only organisms that are adapted to their present environments. Which characteristics will be selected depends on which variations happen to be present at a given time in a given place. This in turn depends on the random process of mutation, as well as on the previous history of the organisms, that is, on the genetic makeup they have as a consequence of their previous evolution. Natural selection is an opportunistic process. The variables determining in what direction it will go are the environment, the pre-existing constitution of the organisms, and the randomly arising mutations. Life in the desert. Thus, adaptation to a given environment may occur in a variety of different ways. 
An example may be taken from the adaptations of plant life to desert climate. The fundamental adaptation is to the condition of dryness, which involves the danger of desiccation. During a major part of the year, sometimes for several years in succession, there is no rain. Plants have accomplished the urgent necessity of saving water in different ways. Cacti have transformed their leaves into spines, having made their stems into barrels containing a reserve of water photosynthesis is performed in the surface of the stem instead of in the leaves. Other plants have no leaves during the dry season, but after it rains they burst into leaves and flowers and produce seeds. Ephemeral plants germinate from seeds grow, flower, and produce seeds all within the space of the few weeks while rainwater is available the rest of the year the seeds lie quiescent in the soil. The opportunistic character of natural selection is also well evidenced by the phenomenon of adaptive radiation. The evolution of Drosophila flies in Hawaii is a relatively recent adaptive radiation. There are about 1,500 Drosophila species in the world. Approximately 500 of them have evolved in the Hawaiian archipelago, although this has a small area, about 1 25th the size of California. Moreover, the morphological, ecological, and behavioral diversity of Hawaiian Drosophila exceeds that of Drosophila in the rest of the world. Why should such explosive evolution have occurred in Hawaii? The overabundance of Drosophila flies there contrasts with the absence of many other insects. The ancestors of Hawaiian Drosophila reached the archipelago before other groups of insects did and thus they found a multitude of unexploited opportunities for a living. They responded by a rapid adaptive radiation although they are all probably derived from a single colonizing species. They adapted to the diversity of opportunities available in diverse places or at different times by developing appropriate adaptations, which range broadly from one to another species. Chance and Necessity The Varieties of Chance The process of natural selection can explain the adaptive organization of organisms as well as their diversity and evolution as a consequence of their adaptation to the multifarious and ever-changing conditions of life. The fossil record shows that life has evolved in a haphazard fashion. The radiations, expansions, relays of one form by another, occasional but irregular trends, and the ever-present extinctions, are best explained by natural selection of organisms subject to the vagaries of genetic mutation and environmental challenge. These events are not compatible with a preordained plan whether imprinted from without by an omniscient and all-powerful designer, or the result of some necessitating force driving the process toward definite outcomes. Biological evolution differs from a painting or an artifact in that it is not the outcome of a design preconceived by an artist or artisan. Natural selection accounts for the design of organisms, because adaptive variations tend to increase the probability of survival and reproduction of their carriers at the expense of maladaptive, or less adaptive, variations. The arguments of Aquinas or Paley against the incredible improbability of chance accounts of the origin of organisms are well taken as far as they go. But neither these scholars, nor any other authors before Darwin, were able to discern that there is a natural process, namely, natural selection, that is not random but rather is oriented and able to generate order or create. The traits that organisms acquire in their evolutionary histories are not fortuitous but determined by their functional utility to the organisms. The creative duet, chance and necessity. Chance is, nevertheless, an integral part of the evolutionary process. The mutations that yield the hereditary variations available to natural selection arise at random, independently of whether they are beneficial or harmful to their carriers. But this random process, as well as others that come to play in the great theater of life, is counteracted by natural selection, which preserves what is useful and eliminates the harmful. Without mutation, 
Evolution could not happen because there would be no variations that would be differentially conveyed from one to another generation. But without natural selection, the mutation process would yield disorganization and extinction because most mutations are disadvantageous. Mutation and selection have jointly driven the marvelous process that starting from microscopic organisms has spurted orchids, birds, and humans. The theory of evolution manifests chance and necessity jointly intricated in the stuff of life randomness and determinism interlocked in a natural process that has spurted the most complex, diverse, and beautiful entities in the universe, the organisms that populate the earth, including humans who think and love, endowed with free will and creative powers, and able to analyze the process of evolution itself that brought them into existence. This is Darwin's fundamental discovery, that there is a process that is creative though not conscious. And this is the conceptual revolution that Darwin completed that everything in nature, including the origin of living organisms, can be explained by material processes governed by natural laws. This is nothing if not a fundamental vision that has forever changed how mankind perceives itself and its place in the universe. Page 64